Hello, uh, good morning, at least from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, good earlier morning from California. Uh, we have an interesting discussion today and even some breaking news, so we'll, uh, we'll get into it in a moment. I just wanted to say, first of all, I recognize this is Holy Thursday, and we didn't plan it to be a Holy Thursday discussion. For Catholics, at least, uh, Holy Thursday really begins with the evening Mass, so I'm not... Um, uh, skipping school today. Uh, we'll, we'll have that. And I want to wish all of you a very blessed weekend in this holy season. Um, you know how to submit your questions, I suppose. You'd submit them uh, via the chat function uh, during the discussion, and then we will uh, have them delivered to us for our discussion. I plan to discuss with Mr. Bonson uh, uh, converse with him for about 20, 25 minutes, and then leave the rest for your uh, discussion as well. Uh, we will be giving away some literature if you just uh, send in your email address. Uh, Mr. Banson is going to make available Crisis of Responsibility, his book, and I will make available a small monograph that I wrote, Moral Basis for Liberty. Uh, you can send your contact information via private chat on the Zoom uh, to uh, get in touch with us, uh, or you can just call the Acton Institute and we'll get you both of those. Uh, we have a few hundred people on the call, and we're delighted to have David Bonson joining us from California. I hope that it's uh, nice and sunshiny there, David. It's actually raining outside, which is not oh. real frequent, yeah. Uh, it's uh, the sun is about to shine here in Grand Rapids. So uh, let's let's just begin dive into this. Of course, our discussion there's so many discussions about just the economy of it, just the finance of this uh, this crisis, this pandemic, uh, and of course we're concerned about that. But we bring a moral dimension, the consideration of the whole person of their respective vocations, of the sphere of their responsibility. And we'll get into that. But the breaking news is the Fed's announcement this morning. Would you like to kind of frame that for us and get us into it? Certainly. I, and I do look forward to our discussion. I certainly agree with you that uh, the context ought to be uh, for people of our worldview, the whole human person, and that this entire affair has invited a much broader conversation on liberty, on morality, and on economics than we're used to having in society. The news this morning, I believe, is perhaps the largest announcement from our nation's central bank that we've had throughout the affair. They have given more specificity around some of their support to capital markets um, and expanded what they're calling a Main Street lending facility where the Treasury Department will create a special purpose vehicle with a small amount of, when I say small, like $50 billion. So it's a lot of money, but small as a percentage of everything going on. And that'll be the sort of protective equity that the Fed will then be able to leverage up to $500 billion that they'll be able to allow to go straight to small and mid-sized businesses. The Fed has never participated directly with Main Street in this sort of way. And then other things like their corporate credit facility, they actually this morning authorized buying double B bonds, which I don't mean to get granular for our listeners, but those are junk bonds. Okay, these were the things that they prosecuted Michael Milken for 30 years ago. Um, they, they are bonds that were recently investment grade, but were downgraded because of everything going on. And the Fed has said, we will now put these things on our balance sheet and support that market. All of it by law requires a little bit of equity from Treasury Department, what we would call loss absorption capital, meaning the Fed isn't allowed to take losses. So there has to be protective equity that right. comes from the taxpayers, from Treasury, but then the Fed can effectively print money to leverage these facilities up. So from municipal bonds, which support cities and states, to corporate bonds, like I just spoke of, to now, as of this morning, even levered loans, and commercial mortgages, the Fed is now the market across the whole credit spectrum of American capital markets. So what, what do you think, well, there, there are a lot of questions here. What do you think is the greatest danger of this? 
from from a financial economic point of view? The greatest danger is already present, and that is that our nation is fully reliant on the Federal Reserve, our central bank, to backstop risk in capital markets. I don't think it's fair to say that that is new in the last four weeks. I think that was baked in post-financial crisis. Sure. So the the concern about the Fed is uh, an enduring concern. So all of our concerns about the uh, Fed uh, are amplified now. What do you think the long-term impact of this particular set of interventions in the last few days and more coming up from from what I heard from Nancy Pelosi uh, yesterday? Well, there's sort of two um, risks that exist, and one of them is is the one most people have been afraid of, and I think it's the one that's least likely to happen. And ironically, it's the risk that would play out if things go really well, which is inflation. In other words, inflation would be the better case scenario here because it would mean that the excessive amount of liquidity that they have sloshing around in the system develops what we would call a velocity of money. Borrowing from Irving Fisher's price theory, the money is not turning around much in society and has not become inflationary. There's really quite extreme disinflationary forces that they're fighting against. But I think one thing that could go wrong is that everything goes right, meaning it actually does stimulate all this economic activity and then become inflationary into the future. But the bigger issue that is much easier for me to diagnose, because I don't want to be one of the false prophets of inflation, is just distortion, that it it misprices risk. It, It doesn't misprice it. It totally takes away any rational semblance of price discovery. Uh, You cannot put a price on risk when double B bonds are in the same portfolio of triple A government bonds. So how does the market coordinate? The the Uh, market really can't coordinate amongst rational actors on a forward basis. You end up getting significant irrational activity as a result of the Federal Reserve distortions into the future. How do investors know what to invest in? How, how, what, what happens to uh, retirement portfolios? Well, here's the thing. What investors do is probably very rational. They, they invest in whatever risk they can get their hands on because they know the Fed's backstopping it. The larger question for may, maybe someone more supply side driven like me is how do producers know what to produce? It, 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 it Back to Hayek's idea of price discovery, those that are responsible to produce goods and services in the economy are now dealing with a false benchmark. Yeah, they they have blindfolds on. Very much so. That's right. And so I think that by trickle-down effect affects what investors invest in because they're investing rationally in what they see producers doing, but producers are operating with blindfolds into the future. It's a longer-term problem than the next two or three months, but um, I don't see them being able to get out of this. The I use the term a lot, Japanification. The distortions are so severe that the Fed no longer is intervening in the market. They become the market. And the real, and this is now back to our point of a moral issue. Because right. you and I believe that Genesis 1 comes with a moral commandment for growth, this is a long-term secular compression of growth. Do you see any upside to any of this? Well, I, I, I have a feeling some of our listeners aren't going to like me saying this, but the upside is certainly that it's going to work in the next couple of months. It's going to plug the holes that are are messing around with credit markets and the stock market. It will certainly provide some liquidity to some restaurants on Main Street that can benefit from it. So it, yeah, there is going to be a sort of band-aid effect in the short term. I'm not really sure, Father, what else the Fed can do. The, the, the bed has been made. They're just sort of right now taking it to its logical extremes. They're saying once the genie was out of the bottle that the Fed is there to backstop capital markets, why not take it all the way? And that's what they're doing. Now, ultimately, I don't believe the problem here lies with the central bank. I believe it lies with the government that spends excessively and needs a central bank to monetize its debt. 
the treasury is writing checks right now uh -huh. and the fed is buying the bonds that are clearing the check it's very simple that is what's happening that's not a political statement right so we have now basically said i don't know if it's in three years five years or 20 years but the moment is coming where a light bulb goes off and people just say why doesn't the fed monetize all the debt why doesn't the fed just print a 20 trillion dollar bill put right. it on their balance sheet and say the debt is quick you see that that's really i think where you're headed and more or less what japan has been doing for some time the alternative is what to reduce debt as a percentage of gdp and i would ask where is there any appetite for that on capitol hill or on main street right what government programs are the people asking to be cut i'm unclear of the answer to that is there a parallel here between what happened in the Great Depression and the economic crisis and then the extension of that based on the legislation, the New Deal, and all, everything else that came after? Not, not really. What's happening more is um, what Milton Friedman wanted the Fed to have done in the Great Depression that they didn't do. The Fed obviously tightened monetary policy in the early 1930s. And right now, the Fed is basically doing the opposite times a thousand. You might recall Father Ben Bernanke's famous line at a dinner event honoring Milton Friedman, where he said, uh, Milton, it was our fault. We caused it. And thanks to you, um, and including his, his colleague, Anna Schwartz, we won't do it again. And, the, and so the Fed has operated with that principle that their lack of monetary intervention exacerbated the depression. And, and they have been determined both from the great financial crisis to where we are now to not let that happen again. But your point on, on Roosevelt New Dealism, there's very little direct Keynesianism so far in the stimulus. It's mostly been emergency liquidity, get money to the people that have been taken out of society by government policy right. on the backside of this. Are we already hearing both President Trump and Speaker Pelosi talk about an infrastructure bill? Another right. trillion or two trillion. Two trillion, yeah. Will that end up having more New Deal-like thinking behind it? I, I definitely think so. What I have not heard discussed or even proposed by, by anyone, and I'd be interested to hear your reaction to this, what if instead of a uh, $2 trillion stimulus in the way in which this is coming down, or now a $4 trillion stimulus, that we just took that $4 trillion and had a tax holiday on business, on personal investment, on, and then for those who don't pay taxes, maybe some kind of uh, uh, ta earned income tax credit uh, kind of thing. How plausible is that? Why isn't that part of the discussion? And what would be the comparable impact of that to what we have on the table now? Well, the first answer is why it wasn't considered is just politically, it was a non-starter for the Democrats on the Hill. Um, because they, they don't get to play with uh, the money then. No, and they and their belief is that a, a disproportionate amount of the problems here with labor and those who don't pay taxes can benefit from an earned income tax credit later. But right now, coffee shop employees making minimum wage have been told they can't go to work anymore or they've been laid off. So they wanted emergency liquidity into their checking account. OK, um, so what would, what would be the portion of that? The percentage? Um, well, so out of the two trillion so far, uh, roughly 500 billion is going to go directly to taxpayers. Um, uh, under certain income thresholds, just in straight money. Okay, let's say you did that, but then had a tax holiday on the rest of it, on the other three and a half trillion. Yeah, well, um, so see, there's different compartments to it. So let's take the the portion. Remember, there's a lot of that bill that is medical, direct uh, medical supplies, hospital support, city and state. And so you kind of have to look at the small business facility, which is right now $350 billion, and they're uh, requesting another $250 billion. And these are forgivable loans. Could that amount have been better um, manufactured around an earned income tax credit and a payroll tax holiday and so forth? I would argue it could have been had there been political appetite for it and had they teed up – 
um, the mechanics of it. So the earned income tax credit would have to have been accelerated. Companies that went without cash flow for four, six, eight weeks would not benefit in April of 2021. They would have had to see this tax credit feed them sooner. And so I think that Mnuchin looked at it like that was a non-starter. But I do happen to know, I'm in touch with people in Treasury on a daily basis, they still view a payroll tax holiday, because those, of course, are financed throughout the calendar year. Uh, They do view a payroll tax holiday as something that can be part of a future stimulus as well. And that would effectively save the employer portion 7.5%. And for self-employed people, both portions, let's call it 15%, that would be immediate money in their pocket, and it would just simply be less money owed to government. So there, there are other ways that this could have been done than the way they did it. I very much agree with that. So much of what you've described feels like a centrifugal force pulling everything into Washington. All the control, all the decision making, as you said. Do you see any possibility for any? of sovereignty, where responsibilities could uh, be apportioned to lower levels of social organization, cities, businesses, mediating institutions? I have a really good news answer and a really bad news answer. The good news first is that I do believe federalism is going to end up being the implicit philosophy that gets us out of the public policy side, that they will not, President Trump desperately wants to reopen the country. Most sane people desperately want the country reopened. There's varying differences of opinion about what the health consequences will be. Nobody wants to put anyone in danger. And ultimately, the way that they're going to go about administering the economy reopening will be federalism, even if they don't use that term. Mm -hmm. There will be individual states and municipalities that are granted more decision making as to how they want to go about reopening their own economy. Now, as you and I know, in that sort of federalist system, the problem will be that um, states that are more uh, inclined to personal liberty will probably use it in a better way, and other cities, states, and counties may not. But that's still superior to a federal government edict that is currently treating Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Manhattan in the same way. So there's the, the good answer is I do think that's eventually over the next four weeks or so how you're going to see federalism get us out of the health policy side. But economically, Father, no, I do not believe that there's any um, uh, mechanic by which they're granting cities, states, uh, localities more administrative ability to to deal with, to intermediate the economics. Uh, It is all going through D.C., either uh, through the Treasury Department or the Central Bank, who are, of course, at this point, are practically one and the same. Um, What... You're an investor. <laughs> you advise people. Uh, what I don't know how to put this. Uh, what investment advice? What do you see? What, what what principles? What guidance would you give to people in terms of what to do with their portfolios at this point? I think most people. And this is true in any market distress. Most investors who run into really systemic problems in, in times like this. It was from excessive debt or leverage. I don't recommend people lever their portfolios um, to the extent someone is a cash buyer of good investments and those investments decline in value. It doesn't impair them uh, uh, long term to ride out various difficult times. Already we've seen o- about half of the distress ha- having been recovered. Um, we'll see how that holds up. But our, our view, we don't look at ourselves as investors in stocks or the stock market. We want to buy companies. We want to buy operating enterprises that provide goods and services for a profit to those who want and benefit from them. And whether that's in private equity or public markets, small cap, large cap, um, we're buying companies. And to the degree that we believe a company will have a market demand for their goods and services, before, during, and especially after coronavirus, we have no interest in selling those companies. 
right. the valuation put on them will naturally be distressed in a period like March of this year, in a period like the financial crisis. But we want to avoid reckless leverage, uh, both as a moral and economic principle. And we want to buy sustainable businesses that we think meet market demand. And that's what we spend our time focusing on. And my own portfolio and the portfolio of the clients I manage, that's the principles we bring. Okay. Uh, a lot of questions have been coming in during our discussion. So I'm going to ask our um, uh, coordinators to uh, present some of those questions. I, they're going to try and gather like questions. So uh, I know we have uh, a few of them. We've had a few questions on um, from a perspective of history. Is this going to be like other crises where the government is going to use this opportunity to grow in power and not recede back to a more type of limited government? So that's the ratchet, ratcheting effect. Um, Bob Higgs's book, uh, uh, Crisis and Leviathan. David, what do you see about the prospects in that regard? Is this going to ratchet up and stay bigger than it was before? It certainly is, and 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 that is the the sort of systemic reality of Leviathan. The only uh, caveat I'll give is it is not that the government will take it that way; it's that the people will give it that way. And this is a sort of theological belief I have that uh, government accumulation of power is most u most often granted, not usurped. But then that turns into a negative feedback loop. And so in this case, I think that um, it is not the cause of additional government power. It is the effect of a more messianic view of the state that our citizenry has adopted uh, from the progressivism of Wilson through the New Deal you spoke of earlier, through the Great Society and, and post 1960s secularism. We're living in an era where the people want greater government and coming out of a health pandemic is a great opportunity for the government to play right into that. So unfortunately, I believe the answer is yes. I was thinking of going back further from the New Deal to, uh, was it Second Samuel? Well, <laughs> Where they, they call for uh, the government, for a king, give us a king to rule yeah. over us? Yeah, and I use that passage in, in uh, Samuel, First Samuel 7 um, at... As my as my sort of exegetical foundation of statism, you're exactly right. The Israelites wanted the king. They wanted that sort of uh, the, the vanity of it relative to the other kingdoms around them. And I think that that is a really fascinating Old Testament passage of how seductive um, the, the power of the state can be to a citizenry that is not up for the task of self-government. Yeah. Another uh, question. Oh, yeah, so we have had several questions on South America and whether or not some of the things they have been doing in the last few years are a, a sample of what we will be looking for in terms of the government printing money and inflation. It's a very common question. And, and unfortunately, this is where a lot of the um, what I call inflationistas, those that have a, a healthy but but maybe not always totally coherent fear of inflation will appeal to you. You look at Venezuela, you look at Argentina and some of the excessive money printing. But of course, Argentina and Venezuela and other countries like that could have printed one one hundredth as much money. It would not have solved for the fact that they had no output. They had no productivity. And this has always been the distinction that I think people will miss in America. We have clearly right now, monetary recklessness, monetary excess. Some of it, you could argue, is justifiable in the crisis, but I'm more speaking to the last 10 years and the next 10 years. We're living in a period of extraordinary monetary accommodation, and yet the United States clearly has um, GDP growth capacity in our DNA as a country that makes those analogies very difficult. So the Zimbabwe and Africa and Argentina and, and South America don't really hold up as perfect correlations. What we do know are timeless principles that there's no free lunch. And, and so to the extent that we believe we can fund a lot of gaps in the economy with money made ex nihilo, 
um, it is totally untrue that that can happen without consequence. So I am when I say that I questioned the comparison of America to Venezuela, I am not suggesting that makes it good and cogent policy in America. I'm just simply suggesting the consequences we'll deal with will be very different. Okay. So the, we've had several questions on the lockdowns that are going on across the country. Uh, and the, the heart of the question, I think, basically is how effective have they been or what's the effect that it has had on the economies and how long will they last or how long should they last? Yeah, the, the effect of shutting down the economy has been to shut down the economy. I mean, it's really extraordinary, the violence of what has happened. Uh, we're now three weeks into jobless claims numbers and in aggregate, the three put together are something in the range of about 15 million uh, jobless claims. Um, obviously, that will continue to go higher until the economy can be reopened. One of the problems with predicting the magnitude of how much GDP will contract and how high unemployment will go is that we don't know when the economy will reopen. So the answer is very different if you have an incremental reopening beginning in two to three weeks versus a sort of um, national extended lockdown that lasted, let's say, two more months. There is very little political appetite and I think societal appetite for that latter, more, more extreme uh, scenario. But the magnitude of the economic contraction is pretty much entirely going to be driven by how quickly they can get the economy reopened. And I cheated a little earlier by suggesting to Father, my, the playbook has to be federalist. It, it, they simply cannot reopen all five boroughs in New York City tomorrow, um, and I would argue they probably shouldn't. However, um, they cannot close a large community like Billings, Montana, or Cheyenne, Wyoming, um, as if they were suffering from the same health pandemic that Manhattan is. So ultimately, there will have to be some ability across our 50 great states to discern the realities right. of demographics, of density, of geography, Grand climate. Grand Rapids is radically different than Detroit. Everybody's saying, well, Michigan's being hit by this. Our hospitals are empty. I live with a chaplain from one of our big hospitals here, and he says the hospital's empty. Yeah, there's, uh, 50, there's 59 people in ICU right now in Orange County. We have 6,600 hospital beds. In Florida, they have an excess of hospital beds. They were they did a full shutdown. They were predicting that they were going to be thousands of beds short. I'm not criticizing anyone who's been wrong. I'm always for preparing for the worst and hoping for sure. the best. But New York, too. Mercy is empty. Uh, the Javits Center is virtually empty. Um, yeah. And, and the, uh, right now, there are more discharges from hospitals than there are hospitalizations. And, and of course, you and I would agree, that's a wonderful thing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So another question, Charles? Um, a couple questions about uh, Bernie Sanders dropping out of the race recently. Is that a bellwether for the U.S.'s, the United States rejection of socialism generally? Uh, no, it's not. It's a re it's a rejection of the Democratic Party of losing in November. <laughs> it was a very concerted effort. As uh, at one point, Bernie Sanders had, was up to about eighty five percent betting odds of securing the nomination, and Joe Biden was in single digits. And there was uh, this is all pre coronavirus. It feels like a hundred years ago to me. But the rejection of Bernie Sanders and the subject of my book, Elizabeth Warren, um, across millennials, it's um, the minority of people that rejected those candidates. And more or less across the board with the older demographic and Gen X through baby boomer demographic and the Democratic Party that rejected Sanders, far and away their biggest answer given was that they didn't think they had the best chance to defeat Donald Trump. So it was entirely pragmatic. The trajectory of democratic progressivism is very much on Sanders' side. November of 2020 was just not the best time for them to test it. So you think that your Warren book uh, still has some... Uh, you, you wrote the book on, on Elizabeth Warren and she dropped out. Yeah. Uh, and you think now uh, you can have a vice president, uh, Warren? Uh, 
I, I do. I, I, I initially would have said it was a, a ill-advised idea for Joe Biden because um, Warren does strike me as an unlikable candidate. And yet I've learned that my preferences don't seem to necessarily always matter much. Yeah, uh, but coming third place in your own state is usually not a way to get on the VP ticket. But being a bulldog is. And yeah. the, the way that Elizabeth Warren took down Mike Bloomberg is what I think has Joe Biden attracted to her. She can do the dirty work for him in the way they go after Donald Trump and allow Biden to play the more kind of above the fray type of uh, top of ticket candidate. So I think that Warren is definitely one of the top three or four considerations. And she stands uh, in, a, in a strong place to get um, uh, Bernie Sanders support supporters uh, uh, compared to I don't know who else I don't know they're, they're talking about the governor of Michigan and and Amy Klobuchar and Kamala Harris here in California um, those are sort of the four major names of course Biden you know helped us narrow the list down by saying it's definitely going to be a female um, but Harris wouldn't appeal to the uh, Sanders no. She would not. And, and 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 I agree with you of the names that are out there, Warren ideologically would be most yeah. compatible with the Sanders people. But there is quite a bit of love lost between those two camps, too. And an awful lot of Sanders people that believe Warren staying in the race when she was no longer viable cost Bernie on Super Tuesday. So sometimes those hurt feelings can make a big difference. Sure, sure. Charles? Um, some questions on China and how this will affect trade relations and in specifically whether or not we anticipate uh, the repa repatriation of some Chinese companies out of the United States. That, this is a good question, David, in, in terms of the broader uh, impact of this on globalization. It, it is a great question. And it's also one, Father, that allows us to really uh, – uh, kind of dive into some of the, the morality of economics that has to serve as its foundation. I think it presents a great opportunity for thoughtful people to now make the right argument against China, which always was that it's an evil communist regime. The argument that we need to be anti-China because manufacturing is being done more efficiently there and therefore costing right. Rust Belt state jobs. Was the, the attack of the law of comparative advantage was not the right moral argument. Right. The moral right. argument was that they're a dishonest, murderous regime. So I'm hoping that this now can allow us to get to the right conclusion with the right premises. Um, but to the practical question uh, at the end there, I very much believe that they plan um, to have a sort of fifth phase five, not, I won't call it stimulus, but legislative action that, to provide massive incentive to companies to move supply chain back to the U.S. It's not going to help right away where there's IP involved. Um, more complex and intellectual property driven supply chains cannot be picked up and moved uh, instantly. But I think they're going to provide significant tax credits to try to re-domesticate American supply chains. My burden, and hopefully the burden of others who share Acton's core philosophies, will be that we make the case for these things with the right arguments instead of the wrong arguments. Uh, that, thank you. That's, that's a very important uh, clarification there on China. Um, uh, Charles? So a couple questions on the particular parts of the stimulus programs that have been introduced. Do you have any comments you'd like to make on the payroll protection program, the loans from the SBA, or other programs that you've seen coming out from the stimulus that was just passed? So the Paycheck what? Protection Program is the most significant part. Uh, it is administered by the SBA, but they are technically forgivable loans, assuming that the small businesses who take them keep their payroll intact use 75% of the money for payroll, um, that they will be given forgiveness for the loans. And then if they don't, they actually get a loan at 1% that they don't have to pay back for two years. So it's practically free money that way, even if people do end up laying folks off. But the intent of most of these borrowers is to basically get the money forgiven and in, in exchange for that, keep their payroll together. 
Um, there's a lot of attention right now in the press at trying to highlight complexity at getting the program unveiled. And I've been in daily communication with both NEC out of the White House and Treasury and SBA um, because I really believe that the narrative being formed doesn't meet the reality on the ground. For them to have processed tens of thousands of loans in four days and have funded what is now in excess of $70 billion of a $350 billion facility is simply staggering. Um, so it, it's, it's not very easy to get something like this off the ground, but I think all things being equal, they've done a good job of it. The, there is real moral hazard in, yeah. in parts of the stimulus bill that need to be addressed. And, and the SBA Paycheck Protection Program might be the least of that. They're, the people have to make claim that they need the loans to support their business, and they have to not only promise to keep their payroll, they have to prove that they did. They have to provide payroll records before and after underwriting. But the mortgage forbearance side draw, is a big concern to me. Essentially, 65% of our country has loans backed by either Fannie, Freddie, or the FHA. Any government enterprise loan, if anyone requests forbearance, they do not have to make a mortgage payment for up to 180 days with no requirement to even claim hardship, to verify or substantiate hardship. Right. Uh, their prayer is that not that many people take advantage of it because they do have to get made whole later. So it's a deferral. They'll end up owing that money down the line. And if you can afford to make your mortgage payment, why would you want to give yourself a bigger burden later? But I think there's very little effort to educate people about that. And my fear is if enough people do it, they're going to end up having to forgive those loans as well. We know the idol of housing here in the country. And that's the subject of my crisis of responsibility book that um, we're, we're giving away today. And so ultimately, uh, the moral hazard there, I think, is probably the most egregious in the entire bill. Um, as far as the other SBA programs, though, there's a smaller facility for just quick emergency funding. I think it was $10,000 for people who needed money in three days. Uh, there's no question there's going to be a lot of fraud, a lot of uh, yeah. corruption. It was, it's pretty unavoidable in a program like this. I should make um, mention that uh, this SBA loan uh, was made to small businesses and nonprofits. So the Acton Institute is eligible for that, and my parish is eligible for it. And we have both decided uh, to decline them. And not making any judgment on anybody else, other nonprofits, but uh, the moral hazard to my mind is, first of all, for the first term of that loan, you have to conform your policies, <clears throat> hiring policies and everything else, to all of the non-discrimination mandates <clears throat> that are part of any government uh, Program. But they gave, but but Father, they gave a waiver for religious organizations. And yes, so I read that, but that that comes after you pay it back. During but, the period of the loan, you you have to conform yourself to it. The first but, what part they, but on Saturday, <coughs> uh, this was to me fascinating. The head of SBA in the initial weekend of all these programs coming out didn't tweet about all of the lending, all of the, the bank facilities, all the programs, her whole focus Saturday was providing like four or five pages of clarification about religious yeah. organizations. One That's of which was, I don't know how your parish would fit in. There were a lot that were feeling that they weren't going to be included because they, uh, in aggregate across the diocese, had more employees than were yeah. allowed, but an yes. individual parish had less. They gave right. a carve out to religious organizations for that. Yes, and then and then get, uh, added further guidance to it's, allow. It's, it's very clear that the way that was written was to entice nonprofits, churches, religious organizations to accept these loans. Um, I think uh, it, let, let's just step aside from from this question of uh, strings. Uh, I think the strings could come later on, but uh, that's that's a caution. Uh, we have to make some sacrifices, and the, the presumption of this whole thing is that nobody should ever have to make any sacrifices. I'm not talking about people 
who are starving, but I'm talking about budget cuts. I'm talking about, uh, to, to some extent, cutting back on things. Uh, and that's what we've done at Acton. That's what we've done in uh, our parish. And uh, I think it's probably the greatest danger of this is the mentality that we always have the government to go to first when we're in a, a situation like this, rather than as a last resort. And so, I, I agree. I agree completely. And I think that that's the concept of thrift and, and in difficult times, whether they were caused by errors or in this case caused by external circumstances out of control uh, on this side of Eden, that is part of, of life in the human economy. And I think that the need to make sacrifices should be part of it. Where I'm more sympathetic is to businesses that were victimized by government policy. Those would be specific businesses in specific areas. And a mom this- and pop, a mom and pop coffee shop who yeah. who had no capacity to develop a balance sheet to withstand eight right. weeks of closure, and yet was forced to be closed right. down and so forth. I think that that is to me of greater utility here. Yeah. That's a. Uh- we only have about four minutes left. I wonder, Charles, do you have a question you think we can answer briefly? Um, well, the next question, on the list, subject, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the next question down was uh, comments on First Amendment issues related to this crisis, in particular, uh, prohibitions on corporate worship or l- limiting church attendance and things. Yeah. Father, maybe maybe you could shed some uh, uh, thoughts on that because it, it's a difficult issue. It's certainly controversial. I don't think it's simple, but but I um, I'm curious for your take on it. Well, uh, what concerns me is obviously we don't want to pass the contagion on. <laughs> you know, the church has a long history of ministering to those. We we had a situation here where the hospital wasn't allowing chaplains to go even at the point of a person's death. And we got that corrected. Uh, what concerns me, however, is that at least some religious establishment leaders uh, in headquarters of dioceses and denominations are going even further than the government has asked. I would have rather have seen religious leaders sit down with health officials, have the thing explained to them, and then say, okay, fine, now we'll decide how that will be played out. Right now, it differs from denomination to denomination, from diocese to diocese, from city to city. Uh, But I think at least what I've experienced is that the church is sending a message that we're closed down. We need to send a message that we are open. Now, we have to be open in different ways. We're doing a lot in my own parish in terms of this kind of conferencing and phone calls to people's homes and running errands for people who can't get out, that kind of thing. But uh, I am very concerned that the government presumes that religion is not an essential service. If you can order a pizza, you should be able to take communion uh, under the right circumstances. So I'm very concerned about this. You can go to a grocery store right now with 10 people in it, but in some cases you can't go to a church. In some dioceses, they won't let you go to confession. Yeah. And I, I think from for a whole host of reasons, both the First Amendment, but also the theological reason, especially when we have this rich history of people risking to be able to worship God. Yeah. No, I, it sounds like the subsidiarity concept is is, is the whole issue here. The, the What government could have done is provided various guidelines and, and allowed religious organizations to administer those in the way most appropriate to them. But it's the philosophical presumption right. that religion is an elective as opposed to faith right. being a core foundation in society. Yeah. Again, I'm concerned about the mentality that this creates, the cultural impact of this going, going for, forward. Well, David, I'm very delighted by this conversation. It's the first time we've done something like this, not only with you and I personally, but uh, that Acton has put on a a conference of this sort. So I'm really glad the way it came out. want to mention again your book, which you, I presume, can be obtained on Amazon on Elizabeth Warren. That may be a necessary reading for the coming election, uh, if there is going to be an election. (laughs) Uh, But also the book that you've offered, uh, 
and the one that I've offered, we can receive your emails by way of private chat or however that works on here. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming on. There are an incredible number of people. We had to kind of cap it uh, at, uh, I think it was 200, because we didn't know how many to expect. Uh, but we'll do other things like this. Uh, my prayer for you, David, and your family is that this Holy Week and this uh, Holy Weekend, what we call in the Catholic tradition, the Triduum, the Holy Three Days, beginning tonight, uh, going to Easter, uh, are very blessed times for you and for all of those of you who have joined us to know that Good Friday represents the heart of darkness, but Easter Sunday represents a hope for the future. Mm -hmm. God bless you all and thank you for being with us.